Between October 1st and November 12th of 2025, the US government was shut down. At 43 days, it was the longest shutdown in US history. It was caused by Congress failing to pass a continuing budget for the government. But here, I want to talk about the impact at NASA and specifically what JWST did during this shutdown. While NASA stops almost all non-essential research and mission development, furloughs most employees, reduces staffing at research centers to minimal numbers, and stops work on non-essential spacecraft. Fortunately, they don't just abandon a $10 billion spacecraft. Alongside human spaceflight operations, a small, accepted skeleton crew keeps JWST safe, healthy, and on track. Even though they aren't paid until the shutdown ends, JWST can continue to point at its targets, run its pre-programmed schedule, and keep collecting science. It's also a multinational telescope, so NASA has commitments to other countries too, but most of that sort of maintenance and day-to-day -day running is done in the US. So, although the telescope kept observing and doing incredible work, all public-facing aspects of the mission were frozen. No image releases, no proposal reviews, no updates, and for most of us, no clue what the telescope was up to. Fortunately, for people like me at least, what JWST is looking at is actually on public record, so we can find out exactly what JWST was doing during the shutdown. We can see how many observations it took during the shutdown, what it was looking at, and much more information about everything it was pointed at. From solar system objects to deep field, it did a lot while the government argued about the budget. In this video, let's take a look at some of the specifics here, and some of the most interesting observations that it took. After that, we can even take a look at a brand new image too, of the Red Spider Nebula, which is the first image publicly released since that shutdown began. NASA wasn't allowed to continue a lot of its operations during the shutdown, but JWST was allowed to carry out its pre-programmed autonomous observing, and we can see what it was doing. So, here's how it works. Every exposure automatically generates an entry in something called MAST. This is the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes. It's NASA's central online archive where all data from space-based missions like Hubble and JWST are stored, curated, and made accessible to the scientific community, and importantly for us, the public. Every entry from JWST includes information like the target name, the instrument on JWST that's being used, the observation time and length, the proposal ID, and much, much more. Lots of the actual data, like the images and spectra and so on, aren't given here, and can remain under a proprietary embargo for up to a year. Some are public straight away, not in this database, but elsewhere. And if you know what you're doing, can be accessed and processed by anyone. That's how some accounts on social media can produce images using JWST data before anything official on that object ever comes out. Despite any embargoes on the data or images, MAST still tells us that the observations happened, how long they were, and when they will become public. This means that it's actually pretty easy to find everything the telescope did during the shutdown. I just went on the archive, which you can do in a browser, and filtered with the shutdown dates as the only criteria. This returns 5,040 entries, which is impossible. 5,040 observations in 43 days? basically six weeks, is just too many for JWST. Typically, we'd expect the telescope to observe just a few targets per day, maybe 10 to 20 at absolute most, but often much less than that. This is because JWST observations tend to be on the longer side, to get excellent observations of fate objects in the distant universe. They also tend to involve multiple instrument configurations, meaning they can take even longer. To even get 10 to 20 objects per day, you'd have to have very short exposures. Very efficient slewing of the telescope, that's just the fancy word we use for moving the telescope to look at the next object, and minimal overheads that take up time in between exposures and observations. That's things like calibrating, testing, or resolving any issues that might arise during observations. We should see maybe somewhere between 3 and 8 to 10 objects, not dozens per day. 
At the very high end, in 43 days, we might see a few hundred objects, but definitely not thousands. So why did I see 5,040? Well, the answer is that not every entry in the archive is a separate target. The 5,040 entries represent each exposure, file, or product, not individual observations or targets. For example, a single target can generate dozens of entries in the archive if it's made up of multiple observations using multiple instruments or instrument settings. We can actually pretty easily see here that a bunch of entries have the same target name. So we need to do something to remove the duplicates and find out how many things the telescope did look at. To do this, I just downloaded the results I got from MAST and I ran a quick piece of code I wrote to see how many unique targets and observations JWST actually looked at. Doing this simple filter gives us a much more reasonable set of numbers. It tells us that during the shutdown, JWST undertook 150 observations on 57 targets. That leads to an obvious question though, of what's the difference between those two numbers? Well, a target is an astronomical object, and an observation is an individual configuration on the telescope. A single target can have multiple observations, using different instruments, filters, or exposures. For example, a typical galaxy might be imaged by the near-infrared camera NERCAM, then have spectra taken with multiple NERSPEC settings, and maybe have MIRI follow-up too, that's the mid-infrared instrument, giving many observations for one target. You can think of it as a target is sort of like the subject of a photo shoot, and observations are all the different images taken, using different lenses, filters, and exposures. So, 157 observations and 57 targets in 43 days. That's about 3.6 and 1.3 per day, respectively. And that's perfectly reasonable. This is also a really simple approach to getting these numbers, to be honest with you, though. I am an astrophysicist, but I don't work on JWST or with MAST regularly. If anyone out there knows more than me and can tell me how to get more accurate information or correct my numbers somehow, I'd be very happy to hear from you in the comments down below. What we can do from here, though, is to pick some of the most interesting targets looked at during the shutdown. Of course, interesting is subjective. So I'm going to make that distinction by what JWST observed for the longest, as duration is also in the MAST database. Unfortunately, when combining all of the duplicates together in the database, the target that was looked at for the longest time was called unknown. I don't know exactly what this is, but it's likely not to be as exciting or secretive as it sounds. This is the name often given to things like engineering observations, calibrations, or test exposures, and the unknown comes from the proposal or observation metadata in the targ prop column, meaning target properties. In total, unknown observations accounted for 127,376 seconds of observation. But let's also look at something a bit more interesting. Here we have the top 10 longest observed targets during the shutdown. It includes a very long 106,000 second observation of a solar system object. I don't know more than that, but it's likely to be something like a distant minor planet. Next up is deep imaging of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field region using NERCAM for 72,000 seconds. So that will be part of some incredibly exciting images when it's eventually released. JWST has looked at that region before, so videos up here if you want to hit all about that. There's then 53,000 seconds observing Jupiter's moon Europa. Then another observation of that same solar system object from before, something that then looks like an exoplanet host star. So probably some transit data or direct imaging observations. That one should be pretty exciting too. Then another repeat of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So my filtering probably could have been a bit better here, but they had slightly different names, so they got through my system. There were then 30,000 seconds looking at another faint star. All in all, lots of amazing science was being done, even while the US government was shut down. Next up, I want to show you the very first image from JWST since that shutdown. Notice they stopped releasing images completely during the shutdown, and this one was revealed right as the shutdown ended. The paper that the image and data is taken from did release during the shutdown, but that wasn't a NASA-specific thing, and the press release for the image was only released once that shutdown ended. I want to start by showing you the Hubble image of the same object first, though. It's something known as the Red Spider Nebula, or NGC 6537. 
This Hubble image was released in 2001 and shows a narrow waist with four outstretched legs and a reddish glow, showing us how the nebula got its name. Now, this is what JWST saw in the exact same patch of sky. And I hope you'll agree the difference is absolutely staggering. Using NERCAM, JWST has revealed more detail than we've ever seen here before. This picturesque planetary nebula is adorned by an incredible backdrop of thousands of stars. Planetary nebulae like this form when ordinary stars, just like our sun, reach the end of their lives. They balloon into red giants and shed their outer layers into space, exposing white-hot cores that are left behind at the center. It all glows thanks to ultraviolet radiation, ionizing the cast-off material, heating it up and making it glow. The planetary nebula phase of a star's life is beautiful, but it's also relatively short, lasting just a few thousand years, which is short on cosmic scales. In the two decades between the Hubble image and the JWST image, we can see the nebula expand and change subtly. It's really interesting to see things evolve on human timescales. The central star that died to form this nebula is visible in the center, glowing a little bit brighter than the webs of dusty gas around it. In visible light images, like that of Hubble, the star looks faint and blue, and dust obscures many structures and details in the image. In infrared images though, like JWST's, the star shows up as red and brighter, and the infrared light is much, much better at penetrating through the dust and revealing the beautiful structures and background details of the image. JWST's massive mirror and sensitive infrared detectors reveal a shroud of hot dust around the star, a disk swirling and orbiting the star. There may well also be a hidden companion star in there too. We can only see one star in the center in the images, but the shape of the Loby Nebula might suggest another star in there too, interacting with the first one and shaping the material being thrown off. JWST also reveals the full extent of those large lobes too, shown here in blue, contrasting the pink of the dust that surrounds the star. Stretching over the entirety of NERCAM's field of view, these lobes are shown to be closed, sort of bubble-like structures that each extend out about three light years. Outflowing gas from the center of the nebula has inflated these massive bubbles over thousands of years. If you have any questions about any of this, the image or the investigations I did into the observations of JWST during the shutdown, I would love to hear from you in the comments. Consider subscribing if you're new to the channel and would like to help me out. And check out our merch too, designed by one of my very talented friends. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.